This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by University of California Press, which has loads of great titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Revolutionary Love, a Political Manifesto to Heal and Transform the World by Michael Lerner. From social theorist and psychotherapist Rabbi Michael Lerner comes a strategy for a new socialism built on love, kindness, and compassion for one another. Revolutionary love proposes a method to replace what Lerner terms the capitalist globalization of selfishness with a globalization of generosity, prophetic empathy, and environmental sanity. Lerner challenges liberal and progressive forces to move beyond often weak need and visionless politics to build instead a movement that can reverse the environmental destructiveness and social injustice caused by the relentless pursuit of economic growth and profits. Revisiting the hidden injuries of class, Lerner shows that much of the suffering in our society, including most of its addictions and the growing embrace of right-wing nationalism and reactionary versions of fundamentalism, is driven by frustrated needs for community, love, respect, and connection to a higher purpose in life. Inspired by Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, and Carol Gilligan, Revolutionary Love offers a strategy to create the Caring Society. Lerner details how a civilization infused with love could put an end to global poverty, homelessness, and hunger, while democratizing the economy, shifting to a 28-hour work week, and saving the life support system of Earth. Revolutionary Love, a political manifesto to heal and transform the world, by Michael Lerner. Out now, from University of California Press. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. There is something deeply weird about this experience. The feeling of existing and thinking through this moment of planetary emergency. The word that I keep returning to every day is unreality. A profound disjuncture between what we know is happening to the world and then how we live within that world in a way that is, at least implicitly, in denial. Even for the majority of us who accept climate science. My guest today is Naomi Klein, and she talks about just this in her new essay collection, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Naomi writes, quote, When most of us look around for social confirmation of what our hearts and heads are telling us about climate disruption, we are confronted with all kinds of contradictory signals, telling us instead not to worry that it's an exaggeration, that there are countless more important problems, countless shinier objects to focus on, that will never make a difference anyway. One minute we're sharing articles about the insect apocalypse and viral videos of walruses falling off cliffs because sea ice loss has destroyed their habitat. And the next, we're online shopping and willfully turning our minds into Swiss cheese by scrolling through Twitter or Instagram. We are also, I'll add, confronted with democratic debate moderators who don't take climate change seriously. Naomi writes about Greta Thunberg, the Swedish 16-year-old whose full-throated denunciation of the global elite has made her the best-known figure in an insurgent youth climate movement. Greta, Naomi writes, was motivated to act by this very unreality of how ordinary life and politics carry on amid ecological collapse as though that's not what's happening at all. Quote, the world was on fire, and yet everywhere Greta looked, people were gossiping about celebrities, 
buying new cars and new clothes they didn't need, as if they had all the time in the world to douse the flames. In part, Naomi writes, it was Greta's autism that made her unable to put the crisis to the side once she understood it. Quote, the clarity of Greta's voice gave validation to the raw terror so many of us have been suppressing and compartmentalizing about what it means to be alive amid the sixth great extinction and surrounded by scientific warnings that we are flat out of time. Collective politics is the key to transforming our economy and thus saving our future on this planet. But it is also, I think, a necessary and productive psychic catharsis that allows us to deal with this too often private terror by channeling it into action and into community, and most importantly, into the world that we must fundamentally change, both materially and ideologically. Hurricanes Harvey and Maria, and California's wildfires, and countless other cases of indisputable climate change-induced disruption are beginning to shake us from this lethal stupor. Some people, of course, had come to consciousness before because climate change was already happening to them. When people's lives are uprooted, climate change isn't just a concept, but a question of survival. Finally, more of us in the global north, in the countries that have emitted the vast majority of the world's carbon, are taking on climate awareness and moving it into world-transforming collective politics though we are still not moving fast enough or in large enough numbers. Many of us have been unable to read the changes in nature until they've become overwhelmingly destructive. People are transient. Many work, commute, and live in climate-controlled environments. We live in a world so fashioned by human endeavor that we can't clearly understand the nature that underpins it all. But there's also this more pervasive thing going on, rooted in capitalism's deep powers of mystification. And so the role played by nature, just like the role played by labor, becomes obscure. At the very moment when we feel as though mass communication has drawn us together across the globe, Klein writes, quote, we somehow manage to be less connected to the people with whom we are most intimately enmeshed. The young women in Bangladesh's fire trap factories who make the clothes on our body. Or the children in the Democratic Republic of Congo whose lungs are filled with dust from mining cobalt for the phones that have become extensions of our arms. This all points to the importance of solidarity in the broadest sense. We must create bonds across the very same lines of domination over humans and nature that capitalism has extended across such great social and geographic distance while rendering those relationships of exploitation invisible. We must, in other words, develop the coalitions that we need for transformative change among the people and in the places where capitalism does the most harm. From the laid-off GM workers in Lordstown and the Apple product assemblers in Shenzhen to the native protesters at Standing Rock and the indigenous-led social movements in Ecuador. Outright climate denialism is receding, yet we are still confronted by liberal establishment policies. This is a form of liberal climate denialism that, in offering the false promise of technocratic and piecemeal solutions, does denialism in practice while rejecting it in principle. I see a form of climate denialism in much of today's liberal resistance to Trump, this obsessive sense that defeating the president will solve all of our problems, that things will be fine if we can just get back to normal, even though those problems not only predate Trump, but also helped make him president. This is not normal, is not only the wrong analysis, it's suicidal politics. Meanwhile, the far right, including Trump, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Scott Morrison in Australia, are pursuing a maximalist extractivism, a sort of nihilistic death politics that implicitly acknowledges the crisis in its vicious effort to accumulate every last drop of fossil fuel created wealth and to use massive repression at borders 
within borders and beyond borders to contain and control the people who suffer as a result. Climate change, Klein writes, has set off these dangerous negative ecological feedback loops. Like, for example, more forest fires, which then create conditions that will only intensify and increase forest fires, which then accelerates global warming, and so on. We are seeing on the right wing today a corresponding set of negative social and political feedback loops where climate change helps drive crisis and scarcity, which then provokes the powerful to resource hoard by fighting ever more viciously to maintain social, national, and economic hierarchies. Thus, in turn, exacerbating climate change. In other words, Trump's border wall is what right-wing climate denial looks like today. We have to not only defeat Trump, but to rip out the system that made him possible at its roots, building a carbon-free and democratically controlled economy in its place. In other words, we need a Green New Deal. That's far from an easy task, but it is nonetheless the task and what you wouldn't know from the corporate media is that there is only one presidential candidate who recognizes this truth. And that, you don't need me to tell you, is Bernie Sanders, the candidate who Naomi Klein just endorsed. Before we get started, as you've likely noticed, I put everything into this show. And I can only do that and pay all of the people and for all the stuff that makes this possible because listeners earbudded radicals like you support us at patreon.com slash the dig. We also have left-wing books to give you as a token of our gratitude, including a book that goes quite well with today's interview, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, by Kate Aronoff, Alyssa Battistoni, Daniel Aldana Cohen, and Fia Real Francos, with a foreword by none other than Naomi Klein. And so, if you have not done so yet, please take a moment and contribute what you can at patreon.com slash the dig. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the dig. Okay, here's Naomi Klein, a senior correspondent at The Intercept and the author, most recently, of On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. She has also written The Battle for Paradise, No is Not Enough, This Changes Everything, The Shock Doctrine, and No Logo. Naomi Klein, welcome back to The Dig. It's great to be with you again. I want to start with the good news which is that there is, for the first time ever, a powerful set of left-wing youth-led movements pushing for climate action across the global north, including Sunrise and the climate strike, and then also electoral campaigns, Corbyn in the UK, Bernie in the US, that are seriously contending for power and that pledge to implement those movements' demands in the form of a Green New Deal. There's this sudden nowness of the climate crisis that's been missing, in part, I think, because climate disruption is becoming scarily undeniable. And then also because the system that created the climate crisis, neoliberal capitalism, was was delegitimized by the 2008 economic crisis. To start off, how has this history finally led us to this moment with a movement finally emerging to confront climate change, really at the last moment when we really stand a chance to do so? And why has it emerged very clearly as this sort of youth-led politics of intergenerational justice? I think a big part of it is, as you say, just lived reality of the crisis itself. This idea that that climate change is, is sort of you know, somewhere off in the hazy distance, something to care about, not on your own behalf, but on behalf of other people, you know, whether future generations or people somewhere else. I think that is the biggest shift. You know, it, just looking at the U.S., which is not the most climate 
vulnerable part of part of the world. You have summer after summer on the West Coast existing in under this blanket of smoke. Um, so and I think that's really significant because it doesn't just impact these wildfires that we're seeing in California and Washington State up and down the coast. They are not they don't just impact the people who are in the teeth of the fire or down the road from the fire. It, it There is an enormity to the landmass that is impacted by these fires where you know schools have to cancel because the air quality is so poor and then of course you have these staccato superstorms impacting gulf communities you have heat waves impacting every community and you have major flooding in the center of the country so just millions upon millions of people have had their lives disrupted in one way or another by the climate crisis i think the other factor is just that climate scientists have learned to speak in plain English and have been putting out reports that grab our attention in ways that that previous writings have not because they are sort of just swathed in these layers of jargon that sort of send the message that there's time to spare. And there was something about the IPCC report, the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came out in October 2018 that said in order to keep warming levels below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is strongly urged humanity to do, we would need to cut global emissions in half um, in just 12 years. And there's just something about, I think, the simplicity of saying, you know, cut in half 12 years. And it's like, okay, got it. It isn't this sort of number soup that we usually get. get. Um, And they said, and they were pretty clear about it, requiring rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. That's... uh, not mincing words. Not mincing words. And I think that was extraordinarily significant because uh, because a lot of the time we get these contradictory messages of, you know, here is this huge global scale existential crisis. But the solutions that are put forward are extremely technocratic and they sort of promise to barely disrupt business as usual, you know, a little um, carbon tax or, or some sort of clever carbon trading scheme that barely registers. We've heard for, from a long time, for, for a long time from economists who have said, you know, the amount of money this will cost is is marginal as well. And that was not the message of, of this IPCC report. They, they said it that this will require transformational change of the kind we've actually never seen before, that they said there's no historical precedent for this kind of change. Now, I challenge that in the book in the sense that I think that there are moments that are not you know, exact replicas of, of the form of change we need. But in terms of speed and scale, yeah, we can look to the original New Deal. We can look to the to the Second World War transformations of economies in, in Europe, in the United States, Canada, you know, where, where the, the manufacturing sector uh, changed very, very quickly. We can look to the Marshall Plan. So, you know, there are precedents. There's never going to be an exact replica in the past of what we need to do in the present. But I think that what's clear is that we need to change the building blocks of modern civilization. And they list, you know, transportation, building construction, agriculture, and of course, energy. Uh, so yeah, we have to change everything. And why a youth movement? Why has the movement, now that it's arrived, it hasn't arrived in the scale and strength that we need it to be at, but it's it's finally here. Why, why does it look like what it looks like? The sort of internationalist youth movement focused on the, the, the intergenerational politics of climate justice. I think it comes down to that that claim that we need to change virtually every aspect of society that the IPCC report said. You know, sometimes when I quote that line in in speeches, there will be people who will cheer, which is really <laughs> interesting, right? Not a typical um, scientific. Um, well, well, study. because normally, I, I and I think in you know when I published this changes everything in 2014, right and you know, the message of that book was in the title, right? That we are facing a future of radical change. It will either be radical change to our physical world and that we get to without doing anything with just and just by continuing on with business as usual. And that will have all kinds of political and social terrifying impacts as well, because you know, in a 
a capitalist, white supremacist society, when you face those shocks, you do not face them with grace. You, 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 you face them in a context where people turn on each other, where the most vulnerable are scapegoated, where there are monstrous justifications for allowing people to suffer under these these crises and shocks. I mean, I came to this issue covering the impacts of Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans, where you saw exactly that. You saw the the strength of the storm hitting weak and neglected public infrastructure, this incredibly unequal impact where if you had money, you were able to pretty much take care of your you and your family, get out of the city, check into a hotel. But if you needed there to be a state, if you needed there to be an evacuation plan and an infrastructure to rescue people because you didn't have the money or the resources to do it yourself, and in New Orleans that overwhelmingly meant if you were black and poor, then you were just literally abandoned on rooftops, and then you were blamed, and then you were called looters and monsters and worse on Fox News. So that's what we get if we just do nothing. But in order to get away from that, we actually need to change everything about our economy and, and, and the values that govern our society. And when, you know, when I made those arguments in 2014, there was a lot of resistance. And I think it was just a moment where that sense of this system is failing anyway on multiple other fronts wasn't as clear certainly not to opinion makers. But I think even even within the climate movement, it was such a kind of middle class and, and to largely, maybe also largely kind of middle age movement. I think there was more of a sense that it's scary to think about system change. Whereas for this generation, what I find, and you know, you can't make generalizations, but the people who are involved in, in, in climate organizing, I think there's just a much deeper understanding that this system that has produced the climate crisis has produced system failures on multiple fronts, it has, is failing them, is failing to provide them with the kind of work that they want, um, you know, anything you know, other than crappy gig work, that it is failing you know, to provide for basic needs, health care, housing, education that, that is affordable. There is a sense that the, that the promises of, of our information economy, uh, the, the sort of techno utopianism of a decade ago has turned into the cesspool of you know, threatening forces online um, that, you know that are threatening them so they're not afraid of deep change I guess is the is, is the biggest shift since I started writing about this is that is that there is now a much larger appetite for system change with or without climate change and what climate change does is layer on top of this this very firm deadline right that says actually we need to get it done in in the next decade and no we don't need to start in a decade from now we need to have already started and so you know if you understand you need to change anyway having a deadline can be very helpful if you are resistant to change and you think things are working pretty well as they are then the deadline doesn't help much you write that it wasn't just and hasn't been just fear of change that's been the problem but the inability to imagine change because neoliberalism was basically set up to in such a way that perfectly facilitated our inability to think about big change. So it's not about about so-called human nature, as Nathaniel Rich infamously argued in his 2018 New York Times magazine story, but it's more like what Mark Fisher famously wrote about what he called capitalist realism that it became easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And you write, quote, climate change is a collective problem demanding collective action on a scale that humanity has never actually accomplished. Yet it entered mainstream consciousness in the midst of an ideological war on the very idea of the collective sphere. The mismatch between climate change and market domination has created barriers within our very selves making it harder for us to look at this most pressing of humanitarian crises with anything more than furtive, terrified glances. And just when we needed longer time horizons, we were able to see only the immediate present, trapped in the forever now of our constantly refreshed social media feeds. It's a really powerful analysis. Explain your argument about how neoliberalism, both on kind of the ideological plane, but also in terms of its raw materiality, how it has marginalized and weakened the social and economic forces that might resist it, how that has all made dealing 
with this problem so incredibly hard. Right. So, you know, I've written you know, a fair amount in the past about the sort of nuts and bolts conflict between the neoliberal orthodoxy and the legacy of neoliberal policy and the impacts of a crisis like this that sends ever more powerful shocks to our collective system, right? So I mentioned New Orleans, and that's a kind of case in point, right, where you have this storm. It is a very intense storm, but actually by the time it hits New Orleans, it's been downgraded from a hurricane to a tropical storm. It should not have breached the levees, right? But the levees were neglected. They had the, There had been warning after warning to the Army Corps of Engineers to fix the levees that they would not hold. And like so much of the public infrastructure, after four decades of, of successful neoliberal policy, those levees had, had been allowed to rot. Exacerbating this was the fact that the, the levees that did break were the ones that were protecting the Lower Ninth Ward, the, the the poorest part of the city. So it isn't just about the, the starving of the public sphere. It is also about racism and whose lives are counted and whose lives are discounted, which, by the way, also plays into, I think, why we are seeing a generational militancy around this. And I, you know, I, I, I haven't really addressed your question about why the younger generation, <laughs> um, because I don't believe, I, I, you know, I'm skeptical about the generational framing, to be honest, right? Yeah. I think that but I, it, there, we there can't is, do it with just young people. So no, and I, <laughs> that and would I be think bad. <laughs> that, and I also think that there are a lot of people who are older who have been, who have built the framework for this moment right. and have been resisting, and who and it is those communities that had their lives discounted and have their lives discounted that have always understood the need for systemic change, whether in the global south or whether, you know, the south and the north, right? Whether in frontline environmental justice communities, indigenous communities, black and brown communities that have been the places where they have they have been forced to bear the toxic burden, well, the sacrifice zones, right? There's always been an appetite for for this kind of systemic change. There's There has been a sharp analysis about the links between capitalism and colonialism and the climate crisis for a long time. Now we have a mainstream movement that is being, that, that is not just being led by, by white young people, but it, I mean, we have to be honest that this is burst into the public sphere because a, a white um, teenager from Sweden was articulating w- with tremendous power that sense of urgency that that many other young people from frontline communities have been articulating for a long time and been ignored. Right. So, I mean, there's complexity there. Though Standing Rock was not ignored and had a transformative impact, I think, on environmental consciousness in the U.S. and maybe in Europe. I'm not sure. Well, certainly in the U.S. and and you know in, in ways that we that, that that we still don't understand. I think Alexandria Casio Cortez talks about how her journey to Congress began at Stan- when she went to Standing Rock. Right? We don't the, the, you know these these journeys are not always linear, and so yes, um, it's complicated. The generational thing is complicated, but young people have had their lives discounted as a group. Right? I mean, economists literally discount the future. Right? When they're looking at um, you know when it is worth acting. And this is one of the things, you know, when I started researching the climate crisis, I was most sort of shocked and appalled by, you know, even something like the idea that we could allow warming of the planet by two degrees Celsius. Like this became sort of accepted wisdom at a certain point, right? That we can let the planet warm by two degrees Celsius. And that and 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 after that, the impacts of it become so great economically. We have to the, the assumption is that there's sort of like a dial, a, t- a thermostat attached to the planet, and we can let it turn up by two increase of two degrees Celsius, but after two degrees, the impacts become so bad that that's where we need to cut it off. This is a this monst- is uh, people like Yale economist William Nordhaus. Exactly. Well, yeah, and and it was shocking to me to learn that governments were using this idea that doesn't come from climate scientists, but comes from economists to govern 
their own their domestic climate policies and their international climate agreements. I mean, in Copenhagen in 2009, governments came together and said, we are going to warm the planet by two degrees Celsius. And when that happened, when the the draft of that of that of that idea was leaked, African delegates walked out of the various sessions that were going on in the conference center en masse and said, this is genocide. You know, Africa cannot survive two degrees Celsius. But the logic in the model was that because it was going to impact places like Africa, you know, and low-lying Pacific nations most catastrophically, and because those parts of the world have relatively smaller GDPs, it was okay to sacrifice them. I mean, that was literally in the in, in the models. And it was also the other sacrificial people in these models were future generations, that they that they're always discounted. And this idea of discounting future generations as part of mainstream economics, frankly, was shocking to me when I discovered it. Um, we've warmed the planet by one degree Celsius, and we are already seeing millions of people being displaced. We are seeing thousands and thousands of people lose their lives. I mean, 3,000 people in Puerto Rico alone after Hurricane Maria. So who defines what is catastrophic warming or what is dangerous warming? I mean, we are absolutely in dangerous warming. So I think that for young people, having their futures discounted en masse absolutely has been a, a radicalizing impact. But I do believe that framing this as just a intergenerational issue of a bit boomers betraying um, <laughs> young people is really depoliticizing because then we are not talking about the systems behind this, right? We also know that the most powerful movements are always intergenerational. So having said all of that, I do think that, you know, coming back to your question about the 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 impacts of neoliberal policing of the imagination, the 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 ability to imagine a different kind of future. I think that there is a generational shift that that is at play simply because I think this generation that has come of age in the aftermath of the 2009 financial crisis or 2008 financial crisis, but really biting in 2009, right? I think that the ideological side of the neoliberal project, and by ideological, I sort of mean like the evangelical side, like the, you know... It never neoliberalism was never about ideas, right? It, neoliberalism was about saving capitalism from stagnation. It was about the pursuit of you know a new new bubbles of of growth and profit. But it had an ideological side to it. It had a side of you know going out there and and trying to convince people that this was a a desirable way to run our lives. That privatization and deregulation was going to lead to greater efficiency, and and that the growth of you know what used to be called globalization was going to uh, you know improve lives for almost everybody on the planet. And then there was the policing of imagination that was implicit in the end of history idea. Uh, Francis Fukuyama's, you know, the, it's just sort of like declaring a quit on the imagination, <laughs> like no, no, no more ideas um, were finished with that. The history has ended. Or Margaret Thatcher saying there is no alternative. I mean, I grew up in that context. You know, this this was you know 1989, and that, that's the year I started university. So my entire kind of politici- politicization period took place in the context of having my imagination policed by these very very powerful ideas that history has ended. That there is no alternative to capitalism that maybe you can stop a tuition increase but you're never going to win you know zero tuition like this sort of thing right so that i think is is where you see a very clear generational shift because these young people today didn't get the hard sell the way my generation did um there's been a laziness <laughs> i don't know how else to describe it from the the forces that gave my generation the sort of the, the neoliberal hard sell. I think maybe there's just a sort of a, a sense of, okay, well, we've locked it in place. Now we don't have to sell it anymore. Now it, it, it continues on its own. And that there was a sort of a policy lock-in, right? You know, independent central banks, free trade agreements that you can't change. All of this means that these policies continue on without having to sell them to the public, right? So I think there has been a shift where this generation just didn't get the memo that they weren't supposed to dream. And so they've gone ahead and started dreaming again about another kind of a world. And that is that is shifting things, absolutely. And that's where I think we get the confidence to call for a Green New Deal.
Yeah. And I think it's also just that they're still making their propaganda, maybe, maybe not as aggressively. I think you you might be right about that. But it also falls flat post 2008. They don't even sound like they're convincing themselves. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's lost a lot of steam. But I don't see the propaganda like I I mean, I, I see the the alternative is Venezuela. Right. But that's not real propaganda. That's just fear mongering. Um, there, I don't see anybody out there going like these results will be good. It will be <laughs> excellent. You know, like, well, I, you know, there was a utopianism to to the project of selling neoliberalism that is just gone. And I see that even when I'm out here making these arguments about the climate crisis. Like, as I said, when I when, when I was published this change of everything in 2014, there were a lot of people who wanted to argue with me about whether or not we could achieve the level of change that we need with just carbon pricing, right? And and saying, like, this does not have to be a system challenge here. We can do this with existing tools. Those folks have l- largely fled the building, okay? And now what I encounter much, much more frequently as I, tr- you know, do interviews with you know mainstream journalists or you know get the argument for a green new deal out there help get it out there in the world is just defeatism right of just people just going like i don't understand why you think this is possible at all right not i think something else is possible like i think there's another way to safeguard the habitability of our planet without a fundamental challenge uh, you know, we started by talking about the IPCC report that said, you know, this requires fundamental transformations to virtually every aspect of society. Who is out there saying, no, it doesn't? We can get this done without that. A couple people. I mean, Michael Mann wrote an article uh, in Nature making that. He took a lot of flack for it because there's really not very much evidence. You know, he used the analogy of the hole in the ozone layer and the fact that it was possible to ban CFCs. But that is not that you know that makes no sense as a as an analogy because it is that you know banning CFCs was not a threat to the business model the entire business model for a very large sector of uh, uh, of the global economy it just it was just banning you know one part of the of the production process one kind of ingredient that's not the same as what it means to deal with the climate crisis for Exxon or Shell, which means leaving trillions of dollars worth of carbon in the ground, right? So, you know, there are very few people who are out there seriously saying we can do this without fundamental transformation. What there is, is more and more people saying, actually, we just can't do this. And so, you know, how are we going to look after our own and, you know, se- selling aesthetic doomism, <laughs> you know, if you're Jonathan Franzen or a monstrous barbarism, you know, if you are an eco-fascist. Like, we aren't going to change, and that is why we should see climate change as a kind of a culling. That's where we're, that's where we're at. So I, I don't see anybody saying the future is happy and rosy. I don't know. Maybe I'm not consuming the right media. <laughs> you write, quote, telling people that they can't shop as much as they want to because the planet's support systems are overburdened can be understood as a kind of attack, akin to telling them that they cannot be themselves. And you note that of environmentalism's three R's, which I clearly remember learning in elementary school, reduce, reuse, and recycle, that only the last one, recycling, ever gained any real purchase and it doesn't even really function that well today. A big part of the resistance to tackling climate change is is that certain types of consumption have become defined as the very essence of of freedom. And I think it's important to emphasize that this is true, even I think for many of the majority of people in the world who can't even meet their basic consumption needs, let alone luxury, because capitalism is legitimated by promising that our universal freedom is bound up with the freedom of the wealthiest person, because we all, with enough hard work, imagine that we might become that person. Why do you think that this ideology of consumer freedom remains so powerful, though obviously it's taking some major hits right now, given that so many, their main, for so many, their main experience under capitalism is exploitation, not luxury consumption. And how might the Green New Deal's emphasis on a redistributive public luxury, a class politics environmentalism, that dismisses any hint of green austerity. How might that get us out of that, this ideological bind? 
Yeah, that's. I think it's a it's a really good question, and 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 those three R's. I mean, another one that we don't talk about enough, and I think we should talk about a lot more is repair. Um, yeah. And this is another thing that I'm sure we'll get to, but uh, a lot of the discussion around the Green New Deal isn't yet really grappling with the fact that we don't actually have the resources to flip a switch and live exactly how we are living now, only powered by renewable energy, that 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 the that these that there is extraction that is going on to build solar panels and wind turbines and batteries, and that it is just as exploitative as the kinds of extraction that fuel the fossil fuel economy. There's actually a lot of overlap. And we have to learn to fix things. We have to reuse metals that are already circulating to reduce new mining. Um, We have to assert a right to repair our stuff um, that is built in such a way that it is it is designed to turn into uh, to waste after a very very short period of use and to never be repaired and you know there needs to there need to be laws that require it um, your question about where the piece of the uh, a green new deal where we look at the low carbon sectors that we can afford to invest in where we can afford to have abundance where we can have this this idea of public luxury you know whether we're talking about access to nature for everybody whether we're talking about access to art and participation in art and here i think the original new deal is a very exciting precedent because i think you know, to me, one of the one of the best parts of the original New Deal, which obviously I think your listeners know that the original New Deal is problematic, to say the least, on multiple fronts. But the parts of the New Deal that invested in the arts, you know, I think we're revolutionary and, and we're underpinned by this idea that everybody has a right to art and that it shouldn't just be something that the wealthy enjoy and that people have a right to participate in art. So, you know, we need to we need that kind of investment again that produced hundreds of thousands of original works of art during the, the original New Deal. But yeah, we need to invest in in recreation infrastructure that so much social science research shows is actually what increases wellness and happiness. So, you know, what I wrote my first book, more than 20 years ago, it came out exactly 20 years ago, No Logo. And it was about the beginning of this idea of shopping as a lifestyle and the the story of the first true lifestyle brands, as opposed to brands that made products and were good at building up a brand around that product, right? That was, we're good at advertising their product. What I was writing about in No Logo more than 20 years ago was what were, were companies like like Nike that understood that the product was really incidental, that what they were selling was an idea, an incredibly a, a compelling idea that they described as transcendence through sports, but was really about revolution, <laughs> was really about, um, it was this dream of transcending the world of things. And, you know, this is what, you know, at the time Michael Jordan represented for them, like this, you know, he, it, Michael Jordan said, they turned me into a dream. Um, Soaring but, through the air with his arms stretched out. But and, and this was a period where so many of the major brands were using revolutionary iconography, particularly from the 1960s, the civil rights movement. But, you know, in the case of Apple, also Gandhi, you know, that was what they were using to sell their products. Remember that the Think Different Apple campaign, you know, which I wrote about in No Logo, which had, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Right. And it just said Think Different. So. These companies understood that they were not selling products that in the neoliberal age, right? I mean, this is the 90s. So after the attack on the public sphere, after the war on the idea of society, right? There is no such thing as society. And this relentless attacks on the very notion that we can do things together, there is still a human longing to be part of something larger than ourselves. It is so fundamentally a part of what it means to be human that they realize this is the best marketing opportunity you know, of the century. We are now going to sell people the very thing that capitalism has stripped of them, which is the collective sphere. We are going to sell people lifestyle and belonging as part of these branded tribes. Now, what I write about in, in that book is that is that in some sense, there's something hopeful about this, right? Because it shows that we still long for it. 
And if we aren't getting it in the way we are living our lives, which has become increasingly isolated, then we will try to get it elsewhere and we will start shopping for it. And this is incredibly good for capitalism because, of course, the products don't deliver. So you go and you buy whatever it is, the, la- the laptop or the latte or the, you know, or the running shoes, and you get that dopamine hit of like, yeah, I'm really part of something and this is I'm building myself and I'm part of a tribe and I'm part of a group. And then it wears off before you even get home. And so then you need to shop some more. And so that's amazing for an economic system that is built on perpetual growth. But you know, it's not good for well-being. It, it creates a, a really atomized, depressed society that is that that is just constantly chasing that next dopamine hit. Now, 20 years later, the situation has gotten so much worse. And of course, you layer on top of it the tech companies and, and the way they have us chasing for that. I think what's Oh, yeah. Exciting... We didn't even know what a dopamine hit could feel like in the late <laughs> no, 90s. <laughs> no, how fast and furious Free it Free social come. media. <laughs> But I think what is exciting about the investments in the collective that we're talking about in the Green New Deal is that we now have a real possibility of meeting that need that will never go away for belonging, for being part of something something larger than ourselves in ways that actually do deliver and do increase well-being. And I've always felt, Dan, that, that like... You will. We will never win the battle against consumer capitalism by shaking our fingers and telling people that they really shouldn't shop so much, right? Because people are shopping for something else, right? And so if you it, and so, it's not just that the message of denial isn't going to work. It's also that we have to meet that need in another way, right? There has to be another way to get that sense of belonging that shopping actually can't deliver. Right. So it can't it can't be a direct just like guilt trip that never works. It never it didn't work for me. You know, um, I mean, I had parents who were constantly telling me to stop shopping and I still wanted to shop as a teenager. So I guess it's just possible that if we do this right, if we design this transition right, that the forces that compel that have created a culture where where shopping is like the primary pastime and the primary way of building identity among the 20 percent of our planet who are over consumers and are responsible for 70 percent of greenhouse gas emissions if there are other ways for us to fulfill that need for belonging and community because we're part of a common project and frankly this is what i think is maybe most exciting about a green new deal and why um, this generation that has been so atomized and has grown up in, you know, a form of this, of what I'm describing in a ways, in a ways I could never have imagined when I wrote No Logo because of the sort of online envy machine, you know, that is Instagram. You know, you know, I think that the idea that the, that they could be part of a collective project that has such a, you know, the stakes are so high and will bring meaning to people's lives. I, I, re- I really think there is such a desire for that. Uh, and a Green New Deal can do that. It really can. There's this possibility for movements to deliver what capitalism promises, but never does deliver. Well, movements do do that, but this is beyond movements. I mean, this is a civilizational mis- mission that we're talking about, right? I mean, if we are going to, if we're going to, change the building blocks of our economy, you know, agriculture, transportation, building, you know, land management, you know, how how we treat one another. You know, that is the kind of mission that I think the U.S. did have during the original New Deal, that I think in a much more top-down way there was in in the fight against fascism during the Second World War. And yeah, movements are going to win this, but it goes well beyond movements. I mean, this is everyone. There's this weird thing that happens where, on the one hand, there's this massive resistance to the idea that we need to curb certain types of consumption. But then on the other hand, there's this notion that we can do what needs to be done through superficial and individual consumption choices. And so instead of decarbonizing our transportation system by building out mass transit, we talk about paper straws. What accounts for this contradictory reality, this defense of the economic order as we know it, coinciding with this commitment to the idea that we can save the planet as individuals by being better consumers 
that consume different versions of pretty much the same thing in pretty much the same way? I mean, I don't know if anyone actually believes this. <laughs> um, I mean, I, like I said, I think a lot of this is going on autopilot at this stage. You know, I did a video for The Intercept about the straw debate as a <laughs> an, an amazing sort of, I think, symbol of why it is so hard, not just for the right to deal with the implications of the climate crisis and the broader ecological crisis, but also why it's so hard for liberals who can't wrap their heads around the idea that that, that system change is necessary and that we need to talk about capitalism in a serious way. Um, so the whole debate about plastic straws makes the right's head ex- heads explode, right? Donald Trump uh, campaign started producing Trump straws, um, which are these red plastic straws with Trump's name, you know, uh, printed on them. And they've so it's, it, it, it's their most successful fundraiser ever, uh, so far as I can tell. And it's this big, you know, um, screw you to the Enjoy libs. Enjoy the it, drink of your choice while owning the libs. Exactly. But I mean, it does, it, it kind of begs the question of what it is about this tiny little marginal change that people are being asked <laughs> uh, to deal with that I think cuts to the heart of the national mythology, you know, in the United States and in and in other settler colonial nations that are built on the this notion of endless reboot and and limitless nature that that the United States is about never ever having to accept limits. And you know, I get into this in the book, as you know, of just the idea that we in North America are living in nations that were quote unquote discovered as a, you know a spare continent for Europe and and it's you know it is embedded in in the very names of where we live right like new you you write a spare continent to use for parts well i believe i'm talking to you in new, in new england are you not <laughs> <laughs> um and i was mean, you know and i was born in new france you know that was the original name for quebec and it's just it's such an amazing idea if you step back and just be like whoa you know we like imagine going like, guess what, guys? We found a new France. <laughs> and it's, you know, eight times the size of the old France. And and it has trees that go on forever and more beaver felts, pelts than we'll ever be able to turn into top hats. Um, and- no more of that old world <laughs> crowded Malthusian vibe. <laughs> right. And this is, you know, it's really important to, to understand that this was a moment that Europe was hitting up against its own ecological limits. And, it, you know, it had felled its great forests and, and killed its great game. And, and it had a fisheries crisis. And, and lo and behold, this idea of the quote unquote new world, the whole idea was never having to confront limits. And so the, the ecological crisis that says you've We've hit the wall, right? And despite living in places that seemed to the European mind to be without limits, actually there are limits and we have hit them. It is an existential attack in the same way that the attack of like, you know, saying to people, you're going to have to stop shopping as much when we've allowed people to build their identities around shopping is not seen. It's not... It's not a tweak. It is an existential attack unless we are able to meet those needs to form identity and belonging some other way, right? And I think the same goes for the narratives of our, of our nations. You know, we are in a crisis that goes beyond this thing called climate change. You know, we are facing a crisis of the narratives that underpin so many of our group identities in settler colonial and nations and in the nations that fueled the colonial project. And so we need new stories about who we are going to be that go beyond crisis, right? That can imagine a future where we where we hit the wall, where we don't just descend into versions of ourselves that are just us with cannibalism added on top and the the, the plot of every sci-fi movie we've ever seen. <laughs> you argue that dealing with climate change requires confronting settler colonialism, not just because it's the right thing to, to do, but also because if we don't, then we can't confront and dismantle the systems that have gotten us to this place. And you write, quote, today in Canada, we have federal and provincial governments that talk a lot about truth and reconciliation for those crimes. But this will remain a cruel joke if non-Indigenous Canadians do not confront the why behind those human rights abuses. 
There can be no reconciliation when the crime is still in progress. Why do you think this this sort of superficial wokeness that has all the good words in the world, but none of the concrete deeds is so powerful in mainstream liberalism right now? Hmm. (laughs) Well, I mean, I should say that this is the first book I've ever written that isn't dedicated to um, a member of my family. <laughs> it's it's dedicated to a man named Arthur Manuel, who was a very important indigenous intellectual and leader from Sequatmuk territory in, in British Columbia. He was a really important mentor to me and friend. He died in 2017. And you know, he's really the person who taught me about the connection between a revolution in indigenous land rights, true decolonization, not the sort of utterly meaningless sense of the term decolonization that gets tossed around so much these days. You know, for, for Arthur, decolonization was about giving land back. And he uh, was from a part of Canada where the vast majority of the land was entirely unseated there was never a treaty signed with with Europe for um, with with the Crown for most of British Columbia, and you know there are strong uh, constitutional and international protections asserting those rights. But what there isn't is a respect for those rights because the difference in power is so great. One time, Arthur, who was just so such a genius, um, had this idea that he was always looking for levers uh, to pressure the Canadian state on land rights. And he would do things like, so Canada and the U.S. have had this softwood lumber dispute under NAFTA for a long time, you know, and it has to do with a claim that Canada is subsidizing its, its lumber industry unfairly under NAFTA. Arthur, and dumping wood into the U.S. Right. Arthur came up with this idea more than 20 years ago to, to intervene in this dispute under NAFTA on the side of the United States, right? <laughs> so he, he, he argued against his own government. He got standing. And he said, it is true. Canada is unfairly subsidizing its it, lo- lumber industry because it stole the land. <laughs> and our, <laughs> we are subsidizing it with our land, which we, which we never ceded. So he's a, he had this incredibly creative mind. And he also had this idea that another way to pressure Canada was with its credit rating. So Canada has a AAA credit rating from Standard & Poor's and Moody's. And Arthur started looking into this and, and, and decided that this was not accounting for the huge unpaid debt to Indigenous people for stolen land. And once again, he managed to get a meeting at Standard & Poor's with the person who issues Canada's credit rating. And he invited me to that meeting um, some years ago, and we went, and it was extraordinary because Arthur brought all of these land writs, and and he collected them from different indigenous communities, and he brought a binder filled with legal precedents, and he made the argument that Canada's credit rating was much too high because it was carrying these this massive liability, and what was so striking was that the person whose job it was to issue the credit rating and his colleagues all knew about all of it. And they basically said to Arthur's face, and there was somebody else at the meeting named Good Zhao, who's a Haida, a very important Haida leader. He said, we know, we're following it, but we don't think that it, that it can be enforced. And it was so, it, I mean, it was it, like, it's, it's obvious, but to me, it was, it, was a, it was an incredibly revelatory moment because, you know, he was essentially saying to Arthur, you and what army? Like, what is the power that you have to enforce these rights? And I guess this is a question now of whether or not part of what we're seeing with the increasingly muscular um, and large climate justice movement is potentially that kind of uh, a force um, that, that, that could require that. And moving beyond decolonization as just a metaphor. Yeah. And we are, you know, we are starting to see some some of that. I mean, there's just a, a decision made in Vancouver to give land back to the Squamish nation to build a huge housing 
project. Um, it's a green housing project. As, as far as I know, it's the largest urban example uh, of what it would actually mean uh, to respect indigenous land rights. You know, it's just a beginning, but it's it's a very large project. Um, and it once again, you know, it, it's a kind of a Green New Deal project because it. Uh, the, the housing is sort of uh, at the highest standards of green construction. Um, it has a, a lot set aside for affordable units and so on. I mean, the one thing I would just say about the Truth and Reconciliation Report that I, that I, that yeah. I wrote about it in the book is that you know, this was a report that came out. It was a historic report that came out about the practice of residential schools, of, of kidnapping indigenous children and putting them in these brutal schools where sexual uh, and physical abuse, other forms of physical abuse were rampant and many indigenous uh, children died. I mean, what was what was striking about that report, and many recommendations came from it, was the detail that they went into where they said, you know, this is not just a human rights abuse that Canada needs to apologize for. It said that this was a practice, uh, this was a means by which Canada stole land from Indigenous people. And that the, the goal of it was not sadism, although these, you know, these schools were sadistic. The goal of it was land right. theft. You know, I think we often lose sight of that in the sort of in the human rights discourse that we have today. It often obscures the reason behind the abuse and just focuses on the abuse. I'm Aziz Rana and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse? by Mackenzie Wark. In this radical and visionary new book, Mackenzie Wark argues that information has empowered a new kind of ruling class. Through the ownership and control of information, this emergent class dominates not only labor, but capital as traditionally understood as well. And it's not just tech companies like Amazon and Google. Even Walmart and Nike can now dominate the entire production chain through the ownership of not much more than brands, patents, copyrights, and logistical systems. While techno-utopian apologists still celebrate these innovations as an improvement on capitalism, for workers and the planet, it's worse. The new ruling class uses the powers of information to route around any obstacle that labor and social movements put up. So how do we find a way out? Capital is Dead offers not only the theoretical tools to analyze this new world, but ways to change it. Drawing on the writings of a surprising range of classic and contemporary theorists, Work offers an illuminating overview of the contemporary condition and the emerging class forces that control and contest it. Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse? by Mackenzie Work, out now from Verso Books. I want to talk about outright climate denial, which became, of course, a major feature of right-wing American politics, thanks in large part to a huge fossil fuel industry-funded campaign. And in your book, you write that from 2007 through 2011, the percentage of Americans who believed that burning fossil fuels caused climate change plummeted from 71% to 44%. That's according to the Harris Poll. The director of survey research at the Pew Research Center called this, quote, among the largest shifts over a short period of time seen in recent public opinion history. Today, a strong majority does believe in climate change and a rapidly growing number think it should be a top priority. But stepping back, how did the right and the fossil fuel industry pull off such an effective propaganda campaign? And what have its political effects been, both then and and continuing through now? Because, after all, even even liberal politicians who do acknowledge climate change still refuse to take meaningful action to confront it. Are we still fighting within the Overton window made by denialism, even as outright denialism is in retreat? 
so I mean, these years where they were there was money just being poured into the denial machine. It, I mean, it took different fronts to, and different forms. So there was some indirect where you had huge amounts of money going to right wing think tanks that up until this point had not shown any interest in engaging in the climate change debates that were mostly like Heart, the Heartland Institute is a and that's really ground zero in the US for for the climate change denial machine and they bring together other uh, think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and so on before this they were focused on the usual pushing deregulation and privatization and and you know low taxes and and you know the whole sort of neoliberal package and I interviewed Joseph Bast for the piece that's in you know in the book where you know, I, I asked him how why it was that a think a free market think tank that you know was not focused on science, and he was an eco- you know the head of the think tank Joseph Bast is an economist. Why w- they had become so focused on the climate crisis, and he was very honest about it. He said that they realized that if the science was true, that it would allow for almost anything in terms of regulation, and so he said. So I took another look at the science. In other words, like he was very ideologically motivated to find flaws with the science because if the science was true, the whole reason for the Heartland Institute would crumble, right? Because the Heartland Institute exists in order to push deregulation and privatization and so on. And you wrote this in 2011, and you had this insight that they were from the get-go driven by their clear understanding that dealing with climate change would require something like the Green New Deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they as, as, you know, as I say in that piece, they they understand this better than a lot of liberal environmentalists. It's not the science that they understand. They understand the implications of the science, because at this point, you know, 2011, you know, most of the green root groups were not talking about regulation at all. They were talking about light bulbs. They were talking about carbon offsetting. They were talking about, you know, what you personally can do to reduce your carbon footprint. The fossil fuel divestment movement was years away from being kicked off. The, you know, there, there were no major anti-pipeline protests, you know, at that stage. This, or, you know, or, or it was really just starting. The, the anti-pipeline protests were just starting. You know, they 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 got it in a way that I think liberal environmentalists were in their own kind of denial about, you know, and this is a much larger discussion about, you know, the history of the green movement and why it has been as reluctant to talk about systemic change as it has been. This is not a revolutionary movement. It is a, you know, it's a movement that has always had ties to elite power. You, you know, the conservation movement, a lot of it came out of just hunting and fishing clubs of just wanting to have access to nature alongside, you know, in alongside eugenics. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, that's another not all all of these groups were were racist. Some of them were. Um, but a lot of it was just sort of like, OK, well, we're, we're, wa- we're watching industrialization devour huge swaths of wilderness. Can we set some aside so we can still go bird watching and hunting? That was a lot of the conservation movement. And so you can sort of understand why the implications of a system crisis like climate change was not something that they were very anxious to to confront at its roots, let's just say. So yeah, so I think that, but your question about whether or not we're still within the confines of this debate or, or you know, what Arundhati Roy, I think, puts it well when she says that middle class environmentalism asks the question, how can we change without changing? And, you know, and the implication of that question is, you know, it comes from people who for whom the system is is working pretty well. So so when you when you confront this crisis, you want to change, but you want to change as minimally as possible. You want to rock the boat as little as possible. And and that is the kinds of climate policies that we've seen until the Green New Deal, which I think takes us out of that framework. I, I don't think that we are within that 
same Overton window that you're that you're describing. I think I think it has really shifted. I think it needs to shift further to actually be willing to talk about the logic of economic growth, which is isn't to say that there are no parts of our economy that are going to grow. I mean, if we're talking about change on this scale, we're hearkening back to the original New Deal. Let's remember that the original New Deal was the biggest economic stimulus of all time, and it still didn't end the Great Depression. And it wasn't until you know layered on top of that you had the economic stimulus of the Second World War that the U.S. finally moved into growth again. There's every reason to believe that there will be a lot of economic growth associated with the kinds of massive infrastructure investments that we need in housing and rail, you know, in new energy systems and so on, and also in the care economy um, that is already low carbon. And, you know, we can talk more about that. You know, if we do all of that and, and in addition have a jobs guarantee, which is in the, the, the AOC Markey resolution, um, and we pay people a living wage and we guarantee that people protect their salary levels and benefits as they move from one sector to another, one high, high carbon sector to another, there is a very, very real possibility that we would, will, will have an increase in carbon emissions because of that, because it will just be turned into consumption within our current model, which is why we have to talk about consumption and why we have to talk about a much more deliberately designed economy where we invest and have growth in the areas where we can afford to have abundance that are already low carbon. And we talked about the arts and we talked about access to nature and public recreation and education, you know, and other parts of the care economy. But we also, you know, we cannot simply add, we do have to talk about where there, there, there is going to have to be contraction for high consumers. There was just a new report out just the other day from the International Energy Agency, which found that renewables, the good news is that renewables are taking off much faster than was predicted, but those gains are getting more than canceled out by increasing consumption, including just this meteoric rise in SUV purchases. Right. And I mean, of course, we've been having big debates about the fact that the Trump administration is waging war on fuel efficiency standards and so on. But yeah, I, I mean, I I think something like that is something that we could deal with just with the right market incentives, but that's not going to be enough, right? I mean, yeah, you can you can put yep. s- tough fuel efficiency standards on, on, on the auto industry. No, we need a society where most people don't have to drive. We also need a society where shopping isn't the major leisure activity, where we aren't building our identities, yeah. you know, based on what we buy. You know, that that's a more complicated discussion that we can't shy away from. And I think because the way in which the right attacks has consistently attacked environmental policy, not just the Green New Deal, but even plastic straws, right? Uh, even like the most incremental little things like changing your light bulb or, or you know, or, or using paper straws instead of plastic ones, consistently this is used to say that this is, you know, a green Trojan horse, which is waging war on your your happiness and way of life and is going to lead to just absolute misery. Or as Trump says, you know, it's going to it's you're going to be locked in your house. You won't be able to go anywhere. I mean, this is literally what he's now saying in his stump speeches about the Green New Deal, that you, you will not be able to go anywhere. Like you will just be stuck at home because he, <laughs> they can't <laughs> imagine another way for people to move themselves around than gas guzzling, you know, single family UT- uh, vehicles. But the point is that because the right wing attacks have so consistently been about fear mongering about consumption, I think that there's been an unwillingness on the left to be honest about the fact that. We are going to have to, yes, rein in those of us, those of us who are over consumers, you know, the people who fly around like it is nothing, the people who eat way too much red meat, the people who, you know, can't fathom public transit, you know, we are going to have to change the way we live. And we have to be honest about that. And we have to have offers for, for how, first of all, how this is going to be done really well, you know, what form of public transit that, you know, that we're going to invest in and how we're going to design cities so that they're much more enjoyable places to live than they are now. But we also have to acknowledge that we are talking about introducing climate policies 50 years into the neoliberal project, which have waged war on the parts of the state 
that actually put in some kind of safety net, that have attacked labor standards, um, that have made life more precarious, more stressful on so many fronts. And so, unfortunately, the way neoliberal governments that have not been completely resistant to introducing climate you know, some kind of climate policies, the way they have done it is by introducing policies that have rightly, unfortunately, been perceived as yet one more thing that is making life more expensive and more stressful for working people who are at the breaking point, right? Such as the yellow vests. Right. I mean, that's the classic example, right, where where Macron, you know, the banker president comes to power, immediately attacks trade unions, immediately introduces new austerity policies, immediately cut taxes for uh, you know, co- corporations and, and millionaires, and then says, oh, and, you know, m- make the planet great again. You know, this is his slogan, and he got lots of praise for that, for being the anti-Trump, right? Despite the fact that his economic policies are perfectly in line with Trump's, his climate policy consisted, you know, his the centerpiece climate policy consisted of uh, a fuel tax that increased the cost of living for working people, and that sparked the Yellow Vest movement. But it is not just the Yellow Vest. Ecuador is a more recent example. Exactly. Ecuador, Haiti, also these mass popular uprisings, the spark was cutting sub, uh, subsidies for, for f- fuel subsidies, but pushed by the IMF, I think, in both cases. So I think that we need to acknowledge And another example, I was just in Iowa at these Sanders rallies. And, you know, as we were traveling, we saw fields of wind turbines. Uh, You know, Iowa is a great place to produce wind power. But the way Iowa has introduced wind power has been to hand over large pieces of land to um, private power companies who have promptly increased rates. And this has happened in many places where you've had rollouts of renewable energy. They have rightly come to be associated with increases in cost of living because we haven't done this right, because we haven't done it through, as as Bernie is, is, is arguing, and as many of us have been arguing for a long time, through energy cooperatives, municipally owned renewable energy, public power, that is not going to increase rates, maybe even will lower them, will gen- generate profits as these... Uh, wind farms in Iowa are doing, except for those profits are going into the pockets of shareholders. If we had public power, um, then the profits could go, it could stay in communities and could go to other services, you know, could go to universal child care, could go towards paying for Medicare for all. I mean, what, whatever, it goes into the public pot. But the point is that at this late state, you know, where people are under so much stress and so much burden, yes, there are going to be areas where we are going to have, have to ask people to consume less. But we have to offset that in a couple of ways. One, it has to be fair, right? And this is a big, big lesson of Second World War rationing programs, you know, where people had to drive less, where there were restrictions on consumption. You know, the slogan in the UK for the rationing program was fair shares for all. In the US, it was share and share alike, I believe. And there were very high profile prosecutions of corporations that were violating the terms. There were celebrities who were, you know, caught you know, going beyond their allocations. And so people had a clear sense. It's not, you know, it is everybody who has to live by this, not, and and the cost of this is not just being dumped on the people who are least responsible, who are, who, who are closest to the edge. And people who were uh, poor before rationing was introduced, actually, and this, all the research shows this, actually consumed more. And so, that perception of fairness was incredibly important, you know, when you ask people to make sacrifices. And the other thing is that there has to be an offer. There has to be ways in which people's lives are actually going to get better, right? And this is where those investments in public luxury are so important because these the changes are going to be hard. And if we do them in ways that, that don't produce an unintended carbon bubble, we have to design this so, so carefully. Uh, and so I think we, we are now seeing many examples, whether it is, you know, Iowa's private renewable energy, you know, leading to, to rate increases, you know, or whether it's the yellow vest movement or whether it's the cuts to fossil fuel subsidies in Ecuador and Haiti setting off popular uprisings, 
we are not at a point in human history where people are going to to accept that responding to the climate crisis means that this can just be one more stress, one more burden on already overburdened lives. It has to be much, much fairer and designed much more deliberately than that. And, and that is, I think, a, a Green New Deal at its best will do that. Stepping back to the, the global picture, you write about how, how colonialism founded the world system that made climate change a reality. And today's unequal world system, in turn, is what continues to feed it. 50% of global emissions are produced by the richest 10% of people in the world, and the top 20% produce 70% of the total. Yet a World Bank study estimates that more than 140 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America will be displaced due to climate disruption by 2050. We've been talking a bit about the the U.S., but obviously climate change is global. How does climate change fit into today's world system, and how will confronting the crisis necessarily require remaking that system? So I think one of the the limits of the way we have been talking about a Green New Deal, mostly in the United States, has been that it's pretty much stopped at the border, and there's been this idea that the U.S. can lead the world by example, just by you know transforming its own economy that will presumably inspire others to do the same. And the truth is it's too late for that. The U.S. is the world's largest historical emitter of gr- greenhouse gases. It signed the U.N. Convention on Climate Change in 1992, which had enshrined the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, which means everybody has a common responsibility, for, but it is differentiated, which means that the, the countries that have done the most and benefited the most from burning fossil fuels need to move faster than countries that uh, have done the least to create the crisis. But also that as we move faster, we also need to pay into some kind of climate financing that will allow countries who are on the front lines of this crisis, as as you described, did very little to create it, to protect themselves from the impacts, to leapfrog to renewable energy, and, you know, do things like keep their forests intact and not dig up the fossil fuels, you know, beneath a rainforest, you know, in the Amazon, for instance, and use that money to pull their people out of poverty if you want if you want those forests to stay intact because they're incredibly valuable carbon sinks then we have a collective responsibility to keep them intact it's not only on the poorest countries on earth to re- to, to protect their rainforests it's the same principle that you just pointed out in the domestic context which applies in the global context it has to be fair or else it won't work exactly it's not just fair because it's the right thing to do it just won't work if it's not well we know it won't because there are many governments in the global south who have who consistently use the inaction of the biggest polluters and historically like the united states to say what they just want to keep us poor you know, why should we act in ways that, you know, are, why should we make sacrifices? Why should we not dig up the, the oil and natural gas and coal that we can dig up and get rich like them when they aren't even changing, right? And when they won't live up to their historical responsibilities under the conventions that they themselves signed. So, And that might be somewhat cynical on those leaders' parts, but it's also not wrong. Well, exactly. Um, so, and in all of those countries, there are powerful movements that are demanding that these governments change because, for instance, they're breathing absolutely toxic air, you know, in places like Delhi or Shenzhen or wherever it is. I mean, there are powerful people's movements in every country in the world that are fighting extractivism and want clean energy policies. And the best way to strengthen those movements is take away the most potent arguments their leaders have, which is this sort of pseudo anti-imperialism that said, you know, it's like Bolsonaro saying, Oh, you know, oh, they just don't want us to, you know, fell the Amazon rainforest because they're eyeing her like the, you know, pristine virgin that she is. They don't right? want Brazil to be strong. They don't want Brazil to be strong. Or, you know, he uses this despicable language talking about the virgin, talking about the Amazon as the virgin that everybody's eyeing. But she's ours to rape, right? Um, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. But, I mean, he's truly, I think, the most despicable man on this planet. And that's saying something, you know. Um, but it 
the point is is that is that a U, if a US green new deal is to be globally catalytic, right? If it is to we don't just need to to decarbonize the US economy. This is a global project. We have to cut global emissions in half in a decade and you know we need to completely decarbonize the global economy by mid-century. So this can only be done in a way that is fair and that is going to take away that very powerful argument that is going to strengthen the hand of popular movements around the world that want this to happen because this is actually not something that is being imposed on the outside. There are very, very strong constituencies you know, around the world who are demanding this change. Um, so the question is, you know, how do, how do we help them? How do we strengthen their hand? And it isn't through you know, what Elizabeth Warren calls economic patriotism, right? Which is this idea that we're going to, in the U.S., we're going to win the race with China. Um, you know, for, <laughs> I mean, I'm always amazed when politicians talk about winning the race for green technologies, right? Or they say, you know, China is beating us. Like, there is so much green <laughs> tech that needs to be produced. We can all do it, right? This is not about beating each other at this. Um, we want China to produce green tech. We also want the U.S. to produce green tech. You know, we also want Bolivia to be able to do it as well. Um, and yeah, what does like winning that contest look like if other countries can't afford to transition to green energy? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a very, not a very cool prize. Exactly. So, um, so, so I think that sort of that those nationalist frames, you know, I think are are really missing the point here, um, and it's why I think Bernie's Green New Deal really is substantively different, uh, because he's the only one who's talking about the U.S.'s historical responsibility to move much faster, right? So if the world needs to cut to cut its emissions in half in the next, you know, it will be just one decade by the time there's a new administration. That doesn't mean the U.S. has has more time. It doesn't mean that the U.S. has a decade to cut emissions in half. It means, as Bernie's plan says, the U.S. has a decade to do much more because the U.S. has a responsibility to move faster. And it also has a responsibility to put a lot of money on the table and in Bernie's case, he's talking about uh, $200 billion that the U.S. would spend uh, as some kind of uh, some kind of climate financing that would do the things that we've already talked about. I mean, it's complicated to figure out how to do that in a way that really gets the money in the hands of the people who need it and you know to, uh, to do it, to get it at the community level. We can work that out. But the point is, is that he is the only one who understands that you know, frankly, that climate justice doesn't stop at the U.S. border. A- another piece of, of what the U.S.'s historical responsibility is has to do with the right of asylums, uh, you know, the right of migrants who are moving or being displaced on a massive scale, in part because of the climate crisis. It is not only climate change that is pushing people from their lands. There are many drivers. In many cases, climate change is acting as an additional stressor, as an additional accelerant. But it's clear that climate justice means welcoming many, many more climate migrants and and refugees. As you said earlier, Pessimists aren't really arguing anymore that it's not necessary, but rather that all of this is is politically impossible. What? How do you think we might move so fast to do the things that we have to do that people say that we can't do if Bernie were elected president? And let's say we have a pretty mediocre Democratic Congress. How can we build use the power of an unprecedentedly radical president to to build the movements that so that we defy the odds because really i mean it seems so difficult but what's the there's no other option exactly um uh, (laughs) it's it's you know and here i think i think studying the history of the original new deal is really instructive because this was a period where of tremendous labor unrest the original New Deal was not one thing. It was ever changing. It was a push and pull of inside outside. And the outside was a very organized population that was that was staging general strikes, that was shutting down ports. And one of the things that I find really striking is that the number of these very disruptive job actions 
increased every year during the New Deal. So in other words, you know, as they started winning, they did not relax. They escalated year after year after year up until 37, I believe, was was the largest number of, of 1937, was the largest number of... The sit-down strikes. Mm-hmm. But it, start, it started immediately. And so... I guess your question, and you know, and this is another reason why you know I've become more outspoken in my support for for the Sanders campaign. I think that we have to be very clear eyed that we are not going to win a livable future without a really massive social movement that is pushing from the outside, and we have to be building that movement on every front. I don't think that movement can or should be built exclusively by a presidential candidate, right? But I do think that Bernie is the only one who clearly understands that part of his job, because the left is in such weak shape and because once, which brings us back once again, Daniel, to the fact that we are organizing in the rubble of neoliberalism. The campaign against the trade union movement has been an incredibly successful campaign, right? And so unions are weaker than they've ever been. And so this is why I think it is it is so important that the Sanders campaign is, you know, so, as, it, as it organizes across the country, is supporting job actions, is supporting workers on the picket line, and the fact that we are, we are beginning to see a new wave of job actions of, you know, led by teachers and but, you know, not only che- teachers. This is part of nurses. what's going to... Nurses as well. And, and you know, and... This is something else we need to do is, you know, if, the, if, if we're seeing so clearly that these are the most militant sectors, also the most beloved sectors, right? I mean, what's so striking about these, uh, these striking about these strikes, if you will, is just the amount of public support, um, the amount of love that is shown for teachers and nurses by the communities that they support. You know, the, the, these are these are professions that are really all about taking care of one another and the care is being returned by the communities. Um, where, where but not by the economy because they've traditionally been feminized and thus devalued. But, but since the caring economy does care for ordinary people, there's an incredible amount of solidarity for the people who do those those jobs. Exactly. And right. you know, as you and many others have noted, they're green jobs, free higher education, free health care. These are the, the ways that we can increase consumption in, in, in low carbon ways while decreasing the consumption that's going to drive us to disaster. Yeah. And, and this is this is why I think it is really important to to build the constituency that's going to demand this change. And part of that, I think, has to mean doing a lot more to reach out to these sectors that have not been traditionally seen as part of the green economy and helping provide the resources to so that amidst all of their other responsibilities and all of their other stresses, there's a little bit of space left over to think about what does a Green New Deal look like in every public school in the country? What does it look like in every hospital you know, in the country? What does it look like for home care workers? I organized an event at Rutgers where I teach called Care Work is Climate Work, and it brought together teachers and nurses and home care workers and disability rights advocates to talk about what a Green New Deal could mean in these sectors. And what was really striking to me was that pretty much everybody on the panel said nobody had ever asked them that question before, right? And they had lots of ideas about how to green their sectors. One of the speakers was Emily Comer, you know, one of the key leaders of the West Virginia teacher strike. And, you know, she talked very movingly about, you know, what schools could look like in terms of, you know, electric school buses and and food in the cafeterias that was grown, you know, organically and sustainably in the local community. And, you know, of course, you know, solar panels on the rooftops and, you know, there are many examples of how to green education. But she also said, I'd like 12 students instead of 30, <laughs> you know, um, you know, if we hire more teachers and we pay them well, right? Um, and same goes for nurses and same goes for home care workers. We can dramatically improve the services that these workers are able to provide. And we are creating green jobs in the process. And we can, and we can strengthen the constituency demanding a Green New Deal 
from in the sectors that are already the most organized, the most militant, the most willing to take risks and exercise the kind of power that we need and have this the community support. They've already proved that uh, to demand it. So this you know part of this is you know the bar- bargaining for the common good framework and there's there's you know some really good work going on thinking about what it would mean to put climate change on the negotiating table. So I think we're going to see some you know we're going to see more of that. But you know at the end of that event care work is is climate work, I asked all the panelists to reflect on on why they hadn't been included more in these discussions about a Green New Deal. You know, and, and, and Emily Comer was very frank about it. She said, because it's women's work mostly, and it's work that is not about making a profit, <laughs> that, it, you know, that it is about something else. And so therefore it is devalued. And I think we have to be honest that it's even being devalued within our own movements. Well, Naomi Klein, thank you as always. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Daniel. Naomi Klein is a senior correspondent at The Intercept and the author of On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that man lives on nature, means that nature is his body with which he must remain in continuous interchange if he is not to die. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get podcasts. And subscribe. If it's an iTunes or wherever, please take a moment to leave us a little review. Those reviews ostensibly help put us in touch with new listeners. But what really and truly does that is you telling friends about the show, that you like it and that they should listen to it, etc. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. Thank you.